So, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, the difference between me and Melania Trump is, apart from the hair, apart from the lips, uh, is that when I give somebody else's speech, I actually recognize that it's not my own. I don't just plagiarize for fun. So, the speech I'm going to give you today is actually, has actually been written by a friend of mine, but I have slightly rephrased it and also updated it because it was given quite some time ago. But still, you'll see that it's still quite relevant. And it starts like this. On the 7th of July this year, the 7th of the 7th, we will be marking the 12th anniversary of the same day in which, in 2005, there were explosions in London on three trains and a bus was ripped through in the London public transport system, killing 52 people and injuring a great many more. The bombings, as you might remember, were carried out by Islamist suicide bombers. And of course, at the time, there were parallels drawn with the attacks on the Twin Towers in New York, which had taken place in 2001, but there were also differences. Perhaps the most striking difference was that the four suicide bombers who carried out the attacks in London had all been brought up in Britain, and therefore had carried out attacks on the society they were supposed to feel a part of. Later, the term was um, uh, created for these people which were homegrown terrorists. So, what is it that led these four men to take such radical steps? Why had they felt so alienated by the society in which they lived and that they had wanted to attack innocent ordinary members of that society. In trying to find answers to these questions, we have to look at the relationship there is between the British state and young people from ethnic backgrounds. This relationship is, is shaped by a set of policies that have come to be known as multiculturalism. They came into being some 30 years ago, at the end of the 1970s and at the beginning of the 1980s. At the time, there had been violent racist attacks, predominantly against black and Asian people in Britain. And these attacks were pretty much commonplace, particularly in poorer areas of the country. There was also a lot of workplace discrimination. It was to all extents and purposes, pretty much endemic, and police brutality was part and parcel of everyday life. And this meant that there was resentment and anger brewing at the kind of treatment that was being reserved to minorities in the UK, and this, in turn, eventually sparked riots in cities with large immigrant population, such as London, Liverpool, Birmingham... Bristol. All this mainly at the beginning of the 1980s. It was in response to this rage that Britain's multicultural policies first emerged. The basis of these policies was to divide the coloured members of, sorry, the coloured members of British society, I didn't write the speech, um, into different ethnic groups or boxes. So you had the Muslims, you had the Sikhs, the Hindus, Africans, Caribbeans, and so on. Uh, and unfortunately, the needs of all the members of a particular group were considered to be pretty much the same. And as part of these multicultural policies at the time, the uh, government made the leaders of these communities, or at least some of them, into contact people, or spokespeople for the whole social group. Uh, whether or not these spokespersons were in any way representative was another, another matter. One of the examples of this you find in the Muslim Council of Britain and its leaders. For ten years, the British government treated the Muslim Council 
as official representatives of the majority of the Muslim community in Britain, even though opinion polls at the same time showed that fewer than 10% of British Muslims felt that the council in any way represented their actual views. And the result of all this was that the British political establishment and British politicians were not actually speaking directly to the British, sorry, to the Muslim community, in spite of actually uh, being in some kind of dialogue with their spokespeople. In other words, they um, could no, be, no, no longer really appeal to British Muslims as British citizens because the channels for political communication were going through community leaders who were not really legitimate representatives of those very same communities. And this led to many members of second generation British Muslims feeling that their views were not really being represented. And they began feeling increasingly detached from uh, British society, generally speaking. Um, and furthermore, uh, they, or rather, their identity was being increasingly uh, linked to their being Muslims and much less to being members of the British society. Uh, and on top of this, many of them felt detached from the more traditional religious traditions of their parents. Now, all of this contributed for a certain number of these Muslims to a profound uh, sense of lack of identity. This in turn contributed to them being easily drawn into more radical groups which they felt could give them a sense of identity, the same sense of identity that they felt they were lacking. And the challenge that lies ahead now in the UK is to go beyond the limits of these initial rather uh, rough and ready, uh, rather simplistic policies of multiculturalism and try and uh, focusing on specific people uh, and uh, bearing in mind the specificities of rather complex groups and not just accepting that there might be one person who uh, claims that they can speak on behalf of a whole group. And politicians should try once again to get their message across to members of ethnic groups as individuals rather than seeing them simply in terms of the particular ethnic group that they come from. And this will not be easy, but if this challenged, challenge is not faced up to, then we have seen what the dangers are. Now, of course, since this speech was initially given, there have been a number of further attacks, including in the UK, the most recent of which was on Westminster Bridge, when Khalid Massoud, a 52-year-old ex-convict, uh, killed uh, a number of people. Um, now, this person is also one of these homegrown terrorists that we mentioned earlier. Um, he only converted much later in life to Islam, and he was described by the police as a criminal with a 20-year record of offending, who had been investigated for extremism, but uh, his threat had been considered to be fairly limited. So he was a sort of low-risk person being uh, under observation. Now, you might also be familiar with the tone of my speeches, and you might know that I like to try and finish on a somewhat lighter note. So I think that one of the major achievements since, since this first speech was given uh, is that, well, for example, there is a Muslim mayor in London and uh, I think one of the uh, successes also since we are in Brussels and since we have since suffered the shock of Brexit is that as a Labour representative, as a Labour mayor, uh, Sadiq Khan was able to actually ensure that 28 of the 32 boroughs in London actually voted Remain. So uh, maybe it's a, it's a good example of, of Muslim integration, of uh, the way a Muslim maybe contributed to the fact that London felt itself uh, pretty much a member of the uh, EU uh, society, the EU community, and uh, is much less isolationist than many other parts of the UK, 
which do not have a Muslim male. However, it's also true that Khan's role has been very uh, tricky because by some people he's been praised because he supported interfaith dialogue, but other people have criticized him because they said he was willing to share a platform with allegedly fundamentalists. Uh, and generally speaking, his work has been praised by many, but also has uh, attracted criticisms both from the very far right and also threats from the Islamist community as such. But usually when you are criticized by so many, it's probably the sign that in political terms you're striking a fairly good balance. So we can only wish him to continue his work and hopefully he will be speaking more legitimately on behalf of uh, many members of the Muslim community as well.